Joe Johnson here at 20 Front Street in Lake Orion, Michigan, here with Ronnie Cox. Uh, pleasure to meet you. My pleasure. Thank you. Welcome. Um, what is your first love? Now, a lot of people, they know you from the, the great movies that you've been in, but here you are performing at 20 Front Street. But what is your first love, acting or music? You know, they're almost... I, simultaneous. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was calling square dances when I was 10 years old. I knew from the time I was 13 that I wanted to become an actor, but, but I also put myself through high school, college with a rock and roll band, uh, and a band back in those days called Ron's Rockouts. <laughs> Three of us were brothers in the band, mm -hmm. and but but I was a theater major in college, so I was doing both. And I, see, most people don't realize it, but where I grew up in in Portales, New Mexico, was only 19 miles south of Clovis, New Mexico. And in the late 50s and early 60s, when I was st first starting my musical journey. Uh, Norman Petty Studios were in Clovis, New Mexico. I was actually at the recording session when Buddy Holly cut Peggy Sue. Wow. And Jimmy Bowen and Buddy Knox, the Fireballs, there were a bunch of hit records that came out of Clovis, New Mexico. And Norman Petty saw a singing group I was with when I was in high school. And uh, we were in an exchange assembly and heard us sing it. And he hired us to sing back up on a record. So I, w I was making records when I was in high school. So, wow. so I put myself through college. I was a theater major, but I put myself through college uh, in, in, with a rock and roll band back in those days. And then when Mary and I got out of college, um, my wife Mary was a, was a brilliant uh, scientist. And so Mary had a, we went to a little sm small school in, in New Mexico, Eastern New Mexico University. And Mary got a National Science Foundation fellowship to Georgetown University. And so she, Mary, ended up getting a PhD at Georgetown in chemistry. And, and I started work at Arena Stage in, in Washington, D.C., which is one of the most prestigious theaters in America outside of New York. But all the time I was playing in theaters uh, at Arena Stage, I, all, Mr. Henry's, in, there was a club in, in, on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., called Mr. Henry's. And I, he had two rooms. And so nobody knows this, but Roberta Flack was playing the upstairs. I was playing the downstairs. She was doing all her fabulous five-part part harmonies. I was one guy with the guitar. Down. So I was playing clubs in, in Washington, D.C. Then after we were there for six years, and then Mary got a, uh, Mary, uh, after she got her PhD, she got a postdoctoral research fellowship with Sloan Kettering in New York, which is probably one of the most prestigious cancer research organizations in the world. And, and so, so, so she was doing cancer research, and so then I was doing Broadway and off-Broadway and Shakespeare in the Park, and I managed to get deliverance. Ed Gentry, he runs an art service. Wife Martha has a boy, Dee. Lewis Medlock has real estate interests, talks about resettling in New Zealand or Uruguay. Drew Ballinger, he's sales supervisor for a soft drink company. Bobby Tripp, bachelor, insurance and mutual funds. Will you go in? All right, I'm looking. These are the men who decided not to play golf that weekend. A little over a year ago, I had the great pleasure of meeting Burt Reynolds. Uh, I went to his premiere for The Last Movie Star, yeah. and sadly, that became his final film. Uh, you were there at the beginning. You were there for the film that made him a breakout star. Um, how did you get the film? And talk about being in that movie and acting alongside Bert, and did you have any inclination of what lied ahead for, for Bert Reynolds? 
no, or no, for any of us, for that matter. It was my first film, my first time in front of a camera. It was also Ned Beatty's first film. You look around, you Lewis. He could be out there anywhere watching us right now. We ain't gonna be so nice and hard to follow dragging a corpse. And, and Bird at that time, if you recall, he, he was, back in those days, uh, if you were a, a television star, you were a slight cut below anybody. So Bert was known as a television actor because, because he had been in Gunsmoke and Riverboat and Dan August and things like that. But he wasn't, and so like you said, that year, were the three, he did three things that year that made him the number one box office in the world. Bert did Deliverance, and people realized that he was this fantastic actor. And he also went on The Tonight Show for the first time, and people realized he was funny. Yeah. Because up till that time, everybody always thought he was sort of a, an ersatz Marlon Brando, very serious and brooding and, and stuff. And they didn't reel this totally infectious sense of humor that Bert had, and and then he did the centerfold. All right. That's right. <laughs> and so then Bert became the number one box office guy in the world. But but to this day, I've never worked with another actor ever that that were was as as wonderful with his fans and 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 treated them as well. And and he was he was, it taught me more about how to how to deal with people because you hear a lot of people com complain about being bothered by fans never ever bothered bird at all and he was just he was just the most wonderful person with his with his fans that you can imagine <laughs> Now, since we're on the topic of deliverance, one of the most iconic scenes in movie history is dueling banjos in deliverance. Now, with your music background, you you played live on set for that? No. Or, no? What's the story with dueling banjos? The, 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 now, it's, it's a kind of an involved story, but I was hired for the piece because I play and because, I, because I, I'm get at home with the guitar, but I'm not. A bluegrass picker. Uh, I'm just not that kind of picker at all. As you can see, I don't even play with the pick, you know. And but, but John Borman, the director, wanted me to to play it in the movie. Uh, but the kid that they found, Billy Redden, couldn't play. Didn't know anything about the banjo, and so we were always going to have to pre-record it, and, and then match the playback, and. Uh, since since Billy couldn't, they wanted me to go. See, John Borman actually wanted me to go ahead and play it e anyway. But if if I had played it, we wouldn't have had a number one hit song out of it. But see, John Borman wasn't interested in making a, a number one hit song. He was he loved the idea that this savant kid was showing up this total amateur guitar player. And, but but Steve, Eric Weisberg and Steve Mandel are the two people that played it. And But John Borman then wanted to be able to cut to someone's fingers playing the right notes. And since the kid couldn't play, didn't even know enough about it, he was, he was never going to be able to cut to his fingers. So he wanted to be able to cut to my fingers playing the, so the, the, the Steve Mandel, who, who played the piece, taught it to me note for note. So if you go back and look at the movie, I'm playing every note that's on there. Because, and I had an agreement with John Borman and we watched that if I missed a note, we'd say, don't use that take. Because, so, so, so did I play it? Yes. Is that me on the soundtrack? No. Did it cost me about a million dollars? Yes. <laughs> I gotta ask you this. Do you ever play it at any of your shows? No. <laughs> Right out of the gate, 
You're in an Oscar-nominated film. I think it was Burt's only Oscar-nominated film. Uh, what was your reaction when the movie got the accolades? Oh, oh got? my life changed in ways that you couldn't imagine. Now, Mary and I had lived hand-to-mouth. See, Mary and I had been married 11 years, uh, uh, two small boys, living that whole graduate student struggling actor existence. I'd never made more than $6,000 in one year in my life. I mean, we, we literally just just barely got by. We were doing exactly what we wanted to do, but, but we were, and, and all of a sudden, because also people don't realize every actor in the world wanted those four roles. They wanted, and see, John Borman, John Borman wanted to do with largely unknown actors uh, because if there's a movie that, that where someone's in danger, he didn't want any character to be safe. Because normally if you, see, if you see a big star in a film, then you say, oh, I don't have to worry about him. He's going to be okay. So, so he, John Borman wanted all four of those guys to be at risk. And, and, so, and, and we, we shot that film in a way that was never, was never been shot before or since. We shot it in sequence, which has never happened before, and we did all of the stunt work ourselves. And there was real danger involved, right? I almost drowned once. Ned almost drowned once. Uh, you know, at the end of the movie, they find one of the canoes broken in half in the plot. They didn't have to do that. <laughs> we did that for them. <laughs> oh, wow. That's amazing. So let's jump forward a little bit. Um, your first movie is with Burt Reynolds. Um, you acted alongside some of the biggest names in film history. Let's go to Beverly Hills Cop. That's a movie that means a lot to the Detroit area because there's quite a few scenes yeah, filmed in Detroit. Of Eddie wore the Mumford T-shirt, which was a Detroit school. Yeah. Um, talk about uh, your involvement with Beverly Hills Cop and working alongside Eddie Murphy. Uh, working with, see, I've done three films with Eddie. I did, I did Beverly Hills Cop, Beverly Hills Cop 2, and then we did another little film called Imagine That together. I just got off the phone with him, Inspector Todd in Detroit. He says if you're out here investigating the Tandino murder, you needn't bother coming back. And I, I love working with Eddie. Eddie. And and there's also there's something about when you're working in a film that that you know while you're doing it that this is going to be a blockbuster film, and it just gives you such sort of uh, confidence, if you will. And so so it was a great joy working. With, and, and see, I've I've been lucky. I've been there for a while. I was in every movie made, and there, between RoboCop and Total Recall and Murder of 1600 and Onion Field and Taps, and, and uh, I, I sort of worked more than, uh, I'm, I'm going to brag a little bit, but just to show you, because I was never been a big star, I've never, I've never, uh, I've never longed for stardom, I've, I love playing the character, uh, uh, playing, I, I have no desire to play Ronnie, you know, I, I like to play the character, but there was someone. This was in the, this was in the mid to late nineties. Uh, the some there was an online um, poll or something, a, 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 a study that they did, and and they 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 they, they looked at all the top one hundred actors in the world, and the way they kept score uh, was. Uh, the actors that had been in the movies that had made the most money. Right. And out of, out of the top 100 actors, I was number 49 <laughs> in the world. So for, for there for a while, I was in every movie made. <laughs> and that's, that's everything an actor can hope for is if you're not going to achieve stardom, to be a consistent working actor that you could make your living and career off. Yeah, I, I did an unheard of thing during that period. I once went five years without a television show or without a, 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 five years. And for an actor, to be, I never had a time that I didn't have a job for five years. Now, I wasn't working on it, but, but if I finished this film... I might have two or three weeks, but I already had another film to go to. So uh -huh. for, for five years, and, and, uh, and I love acting, don't get me wrong. I just don't love it quite as much <laughs> as the music. Right. 
And, and I can tell you why. Uh, with acting, no matter what kind of acting it is, movies, television, plays, you name it, there is and must be that imaginary fourth wall between you and the audience. You can't step through the camera or step off the stage and talk to the people. And with the kind of show I do, because I'm a storyteller too, there is the possibility of a profound one-on-one -on -one sharing that can take place. And, and doesn't always happen, but that's an opiate that is undeniable. And, and so that's what, uh, that's what draws me to, because I made a decision about eight or 10 years ago, I still act, but I turned down about 80% of the acting jobs I'm offered because I just prefer playing music. I've gone for the big money of folk music. <laughs> right. yeah, there are dozens of dollars to be made in folk music. <laughs> and a lot of that goes back into your production values, right? <laughs> it does. <laughs> Doggone my mind just won't leave me alone Keeps on reminding me I'm so far from home Those hearts Breaking, naked eggs and bacon country song. Take me back to hard floors, outdoor jobs and mason jars. It's all I can do to believe that it's gone. That hard knocking, rocking, rolling life I have known. The dancing. How I love them old songs Doggone my soul How I love them old songs You mentioned RoboCop earlier. I have this memory of going to the movie theater and seeing the cardboard standee of RoboCop and seeing the title RoboCop, and I'm like, what the hell is this? What was your reaction when you saw that title, you saw that script? How did you go from that to being in the movie and making an awesome sci-fi blockbuster? Well, see, that was another thing, too. It, especially in the old days, but, but it, there's a great tendency to typecast you. And since I played Drew in Deliverance, the moral one, the good one, the, 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 the good guy, I got cast for, for the next 10 or 15 years as Mr. Boy Scout Nice Guy. If, if, if a role had any guts to it, I sort of didn't, because I, there was a term that I was what's known in, in Hollywood as a soft actor. So if, if, if the role had any guts to it, uh, you know, Ronnie's a little too soft for that. And so, so I, I, and it was frustrating to me because I'm an athlete, I'm a former marathoner, yeah, I've done all, uh, with, the, with the canoeing and, you know, I'm a pretty handy guy. And, and for me to be only cast in milk toasty roles <laughs> bothered me a bit. And so when RoboCop came along, in many ways, RoboCop was as big a boon to my career as Deliverance was because I had been known as, now all of a sudden, I've, I was, here again, I was voted the number one villain uh, 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 in movies for, for playing Cohagen and Dick Jones. And, and uh, so all, and, and someone said this to me and it's one of the best compliments I ever got. Because one of the reasons Paul Verhoeven cast me as Dick Jones is because of this residual goodwill that I had sort of as a person in Hollywood. You know, so they, they looked at my character and he was going to be a good guy. And when Dick Jones turned out not to be a good guy, and, and then that made him twice as evil in a way. And, and someone said, uh, I love this, he said, said, Ronnie, casting you as Dick Jones, said, said it's kind of like you're an astronaut 
that's gone bad. <laughs> <laughs> so your, your nice guy persona lent itself to the role and kind of fooled the audience. Yeah, Paul Verhoeven wanted that, wanted that for them to think that this, so that when, when that guy isn't, because, because, see, I, I got to tell you the truth. The script of RoboCop wasn't that good. <laughs> What made it great was Paul Verhoeven finding us a way to make us care about that guy and the humor that was in there. And because, because when I read the script, the, the, tell you the truth, the only reason I was interested in doing it was because it was a chance to play a bad guy. Yeah. Uh, I didn't see, and it's only when, when I saw what Paul, well, when I went in and met with Paul, and, and I saw what his take on the film was, and I said, oh, this is going to... And I don't know if you know this or not. Uh, a, a British company has made a, a film called RoboDoc. And they've gone and they've gotten over a hundred of us that were in the original RoboCop, Paul Verhoeven, Paul uh, 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 Peter Weller, every one of us. And, and, and have, they have done the definitive documentary of the making of RoboCop, and it's supposed to be really, really, really good. And you heard there, they did a GoFundMe campaign to build a RoboCop statue to be erected in Detroit somewhere, did you? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm sad that they made RoboCop 2, uh, or 3, or how many. But because, see, I hate sequels. I, I mean, to me, this is a bad joke, but I'll tell it anyway. Making sequels is like putting on a wet bathing suit. <laughs> I mean, you, you, it's just, I didn't want to be in Cop 2, Beverly Hills Cop 2, but, but since Bogomil getting shot was the reason for Eddie's character to come back, to, to, so, so I did that. But when they, they wanted me for, Robo, uh, for Beverly Hills Cop 3, uh, I read the script. Uh, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then when Eddie and I were doing... Imagine that together. The, the producer, the executive producer on that show, had the rights to Beverly Hills Cop Four, and and he 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 came to me one day and I said, Ronnie, would you be interested in doing Beverly Hills Cop Four? <laughs> and I said, Does the terms "fat chance sweetheart" mean anything to you? <laughs> right. Now, Paul Verhoeven, he obviously liked you enough in RoboCop to bring you to Total Recall. Was yeah. that was that your role to turn down if you chose to, or how did that work getting oh, into? Oh yeah, but Happy I love saying Arnold. Oh, I love I love working with Paul. Uh, uh, I think I mentioned earlier my wife had a PhD in chemistry. Well, Paul also has a PhD in chemistry, so he he and Mary really hit it off really well. And and now Paul is a really. I mean, his he's a legend. His volatility is, is legendary. But I never had an, a moment's problem with him. And, and it was kind of funny when I was doing, we shot Total Recall in Mexico City. We took over the, the whole of the Churubusco Studios there. So I was playing Vilos Cohen, who's the most evil man in the universe. But, at the, very, but, but the, the timing got screwed up. And I was also under contract doing another, I was doing a film, the, the Canon, uh, was doing a, a, a production of Captain America. Ronnie Cox, Ned Beatty, Darren McGavin, Michael Nury, Melinda Dillon, Kim Gillingham, Scott Paulin as the Red Skull, and Matt Salinger as the Marvel Comics hero, Captain America. And we were shooting that in, in Yugoslavia. We were shooting in, in, in Dubrovnik, Yugoslavia. So, so I'm flying, and we're shooting them both at the same time. I'm flying back and forth from Yugoslavia to Mexico City, and and uh, Vilos Kohagen is the most evil man in the in the universe, and and the guy in Captain America is the sweetest, nicest president. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 I had to sort of look down and see who I was playing. <laughs> So you, you worked alongside Bert, Eddie, and Arnold Schwarzenegger. What, what was it like working with Arnold? Uh, Arnold is a bit of a bully. Yeah. And, and I found out uh, early on that, that if, you, if you roll over, he'll keep doing it. And the way to get along with him is to, is to stand up. And once you, once you stand up to him, 
then thing so Arnold and I ended up having a really wonderful relationship so let me let me wrap up with this um do you feel that your success as a film actor has allowed you the freedom the, the artistic freedom to perform and play and tour i heard you do at least 80 shows a year across the country do you feel that acting has given you the freedom to pursue this no it's sort of the opposite <laughs> because in some ways you have to live down being an actor i mean because there's been Let's face it, there are a whole bunch of guys that, that think just because they were an actor they can go put a guitar around their neck and all of a sudden they're, they're and so there, there are a lot of guys that are really awful at it, although having said that, I think he's a Michigander, a Michigander. Uh, uh, Jeff Daniels is a really, really wonderful singer songwriter right. and, and he and I compare notes every now and then, I mean, he, but the but let's face it, there are a whole lot. No, I, I've been lucky. I've had a great career, and 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 the the like I said, the thing that draws me to this, I'm in this for a completely different reason than a lot of people are. I'm not. I need to get paid, obviously, because you can't have an expensive hobby. But I'm, I'm doing this for me, and and I never feel more vital or alive as when I'm with an audience being able to 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 communicate with an audience and 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 that sense of sharing just becomes a thing that that is an opiate that's undeniable what can the audience tonight expect uh, from your show who knows <laughs> I, I i just see what what i do uh, my show starts we were talking earlier that i don't go in the green room um my show starts as soon as they open the house and and I, I, even if it's four or five hundred people in the are you know a lot of big folk festivals they can't do that but if it's if it's five six hundred people i will have had a conversation with everybody in the audience before the show starts and and my show is a natural extension of what we were talking about before so i wanted this to feel as much like it used to be when we were kids growing up, sitting in the living room or the kitchen or the front porch with family and friends trading stories and songs. And, and so that's what I want it to be like. Awesome. Ronnie, absolute pleasure meeting you. My pleasure. Have a great show tonight. Ah, thanks. From 20 Front Street, I'm Joe Johnson. Sheep, grass, water, and the sun descended. If a colt's gonna make it, his life's dependent on sanctuary. Breaks a pretty on a canyon floor. It's a place that she's been looking for. She tests with the wind until she's sure. It's sanctuary. There's a soft side pocket where the rim rocks in dead. She grass water and the sun ascending. Lord, would you give them some time to spend in sanctuary? With a brand new fold. Sanctuary. Sanctuary. 
sanctuary. 